to teach this way in the scriptures and understand that this is the accumulation of, of, of walking in spiritual maturity and learning things along the way. The, when you're following the Lord for 10 or 20 years, you're, not, you're going to have a lot more to work with than your first week. Amen? So you're learning things along the way. Tonight, as we study the, the uh, mercy seat, understand that this is about the presence of the Lord in your life now. Most people, believers, never get to this place. They never, uh, for whatever reason, there's a lot of reasons, the Lord desires your fellowship. The scriptures tell you this, that God died. He sent his son to die for you, that he can have fellowship with you. Remember something Yeshua said when Jesus was Talk, praying in John 17, he said that I've delivered all of these to you, except one, the son of perdition, right? All of them, he, he says, I've, I've brought them, he brought them to the Father. So I'm going to breeze through Isaiah 67, but this is a place, this is a spiritual condition, everlasting joy. This is a place in our lives, and I'm not going to read all of Isaiah 61 here, but this whole prophecy here is about learning to know the Lord. Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. And, and instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. That's supposed to be our spiritual condition right now. And we all go through the rigmaroles of life. We have our ups and we have our downs. But the like David said, the joy of the Lord is our strength. It has to be our reality. It's not just something that we shoot for. Olam Simcha is everlasting joy in Hebrew, and that's where God wants us to walk. You see, that's his kingdom is in us. And as you realize that, that is what you want to be a good witness for the Lord? Be filled with everlasting joy. You'll attract other people into your life. It's not about you going up and, you know, bashing people over the head with the gospel. It's about you being filled with something that they don't have, and they can sense that, and they want that. And that's where we are when we talk about tonight the symbolism of the tabernacle. Remember, we've been looking at this verse. Every one of these of 12 now, we've read this verse. And this is supposed to be, again, our reality. But as it is written... Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Those who love him. It's not about obeying him. It doesn't say obey him. It doesn't say you have to do this, 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 and this. Love is a condition of your heart. Do you love him? You know, I love my wife. I'm not always happy with my wife. She's not always happy with me. I hope she doesn't keep score. But I love her. It's the state of who and what I am, and it's the same with the Lord. So tonight as we talk about entering in through the veil, we look at the mercy seat. This is the, the two angels that sat on top of the Ark of the Covenant looking at each other. Their heads were bowed. We're going through the veil. That's a spiritual veil. Inside that spiritual veil is your spiritual life. It is life in the Holy Spirit. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen? John 14, 6. Well, how do you do that? We've been ha having the lessons all along, but his presence is within the Holy of Holies. And last week we looked at the mercy or the the Ark of the Covenant and these things that are in us. Now we're looking at the presence of God in our lives, and it's a powerful teaching because if you can understand this, it's going to change your life. It's going to change your life eternally because you realize your eternal life starts now. Even though you're in this body, we're all trapped inside of these mortal bodies. Your spirit becomes alive to the things of God. From within the Holy of Holies, the light of God's literal presence was witnessed. We're not talking theory here. His literal presence is with us. If we can realize that, it's going to change the way you live. It's going to change the way you do everything because you realize you're never, ever, ever alone. 
And that's what the Holy of Holies is all about. And that's what the reality of the mercy seat is showing us. This light inside the Holy of Holies was given by God alone. Remember in the holy, in the holy place, it was the menorah, the seven-branch candlestick. Inside the Holy of Holies, on the other side of a dark veil, the light was God himself. And this is something we need to understand. It says in the book of Revelation that the sun and the moon and the stars won't be needed when Yeshua returns. You know why? He is going to be the light. All the light we need. Now, we look at the sun and during the day, and that's a lot of light, isn't it? But that sun's going to be nothing compared to the light the Lord gives off. But that light that he has for us now is a spiritual light that's to be within us. The light was a type of light God would use to prophesy about the coming Messiah. You see, don't take for granted what you have right now as a believer because you see things the way unbelievers cannot see because they're in darkness. We have a bit of light, but it's enough light to show us the way that's provided for by our Lord. And that light is, a, is an extreme light. Isaiah 60 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. That's a prophecy about being born again of the Spirit, and His Spirit is light. And what does light do? It allows us to see. But not physical light, spiritual light light. God wants you to understand that your spiritual eyes need to be opened. Until Yeshua, the Messiah, is in your life, your spiritual eyes are blinded. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. This reflects right back to the book of Acts, to when the 120 were in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, and all of a sudden they're baptized with the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, the little bit of light they had, all of a sudden was, they were baptized in that same light. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Again, this is not talking about natural light. It's talking about spiritual light. That's why you say, well, gee, those people, they don't understand. Right. They don't have any light. When you don't believe, you don't have the light. One, the reason that the Jews today are under any curse is because they don't believe. Anybody that does not believe is under the abject power of a curse, the curse of unbelief. And what does that unbelief do, that curse of unbelief do? It makes you blind to the spiritual truth that you can only see by the Holy Spirit in your life. And that Holy Spirit is brought to you by your faith in Jesus the Messiah. The light is the true light. And, and you know, people argue, you know, I've... I've talked with people that are witches or in the occult or something. They'll always talk about their light. Well, I have a light. No, their light is not the true light. Their light is actually darkness. John 1. You like that? Kind of like, makes it look like rain. Anyway. John 1. This is what John wrote. He was not that light. Speaking of John the Baptist here, Okay. But look at how he says this. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Everybody's eligible for it. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Speaking of Yeshua. But what was Yeshua? That light. That's the concept of the mercy seat, is the walking into his presence, is walking into his light. Do you see Yeshua? He is the light of the world. He said that. He's the light of the world. Now you understand what he was talking about. 
in John 12. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. In other words, if you see the Son of God, you see the Father. You see, they're one. In Hebrew, it's echad, they're one. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Should not. Some do anyway. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. That's one of the things, you know, you know people talk about, uh, you, know, the, oh, you know, Jesus is going to send you to hell. No, he came that you might not go to hell. Fact is, you were going to hell anyway. The only way that you have not to go to hell is through Yeshua. There's no other way. So, a shadow of the coming Messiah is what we see in the mercy seat. A shadow of the coming of the Messiah. And this is this is to me it's very exciting stuff. Remember, this whole teaching has been about your spiritual life, your spiritual journey. You are on a walk to get through heaven's gate. Amen? My job as the shepherd here is to help you get to that gate. The mercy seat within the Holy of Holies was to Israel the same thing, the revelation of God and his presence in this world. Remember that the tabernacle sat right in the middle of of the Hebrew people. There's 12 tribes, three tribes on the north, south, east, and west of the tabernacle, and right smack in the middle of all of them was the tabernacle, and right smack middle in the, of the tabernacle was the Holy of Holies. And right in there was the mercy seat where the presence of God was known. We talked about this a couple times. The approach to God is always, always, always worship, fellowship, revelation. Worship. You begin to worship in your heart. And I'm not talking about standing on top of your car screaming. I'm talking about in your heart just worshiping the Lord, whatever way that you are. Your worship opens the way to fellowship with the Lord. That worship and fellowship taking place opens you up to the revelation of what and who God is. Remember, it says in the Proverbs, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Right? The fear of the Lord. Worship, fellowship. If you have true fellowship with the Lord, you're going to have what is known as the fear of the Lord. Which is not fear as we would know it from man. It's not ducking under a chair it's not like Adam and Eve who were afraid and they hid themselves no the fear of the Lord is you coming to the Lord understanding who he is and embracing him for who he is he is God worship fellowship revelation worship fellowship revelation wherever you are if you're by yourself if you're with a group of people Worship, fellowship, revelation. That's always the pattern that we see. Our worship brings us into fellowship with the Lord. The scripture says, God inhabits the praises of his people, Israel. He inhabits your praises. And it's all represented in the Holy of Holies at the mercy seat. Our fellowship is in his presence. His word to us is our life. It's not about being religious at all, is it? Your religion will never get you into fellowship with him. Your religion will keep you away from him. Your religion is not what he's looking for. He wants fellowship with you, and he is God. Worship, fellowship, fellowship. Revelation. We have fellowship with the Lord in his presence. He will guide you. He will lead you. You can ask him questions and he'll give you the perfect answer every time. Of course, you may not be ready to hear the perfect answer 
every time. But he'll give it to you if you honestly go to him and ask about it. Worship, fellowship, and then the revelation. These are the things that he gives to us. The Shekinah. Now, if you were grown up in Pentecostal churches from the deep south, they call it the Shekinah glory. But it's pronounced Shekinah. Hundreds of years before Yeshua came, Israel looked for their Messiah who would bear the Shekinah, the light of God's glory. The mercy seat depicts the place where God communes with his people. It's a brilliant light. It says in Proverbs 1, How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded. <laughs> the Lord is always trying to reach us. He's always trying to speak to us. But we don't regard him, so we don't receive what he has to say. And, he, and wisdom is crying out in these Proverbs Wisdom is cry it says wisdom is crying out and nobody's listening at the mercy seat where you're listening and seeing God literally at work and you're literally in his presence his wisdom is going to be flooding itself toward you our life in the holy of holies is a life of worship fellowship and revelation you should have this action going on every day of your life worship fellowship revelation i've heard i've heard preachers say over the years Oh, I don't think God can speak to you every day. My, my answer is, well, do you pray every day? Because God is always speaking to us. The question is, are we listening? Because th you'll find that this is God's way of bringing us close to him. Worship, fellowship, and revelation. The mercy seat depicts the place where God communes with his people in your life. And this could be where do you pray in your house? Where do you go to pray in your house? This is that place. It's where the light's coming on. Where do you pray in the morning? At the kitchen table, in your easy chair, on your patio, in your car, whatever. That's your place of communion with the Lord. It says in Exodus 25, You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. Remember those three items that we talked about last week? Those, that's the Ark of the Testimony that represents the authority that he's given to us that should reside in us. And he wants you to have the confidence that he's going to talk to you and reside with you. Did I read that already? You shall put the mercy. Yeah, I did. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in the commandment to the children of Israel. You know, this is, the Lord showed me something many years ago, and, and it, you know, we often see in the Old and New Covenant, we see this all the time. If you keep my commandments... You've heard that. And your, your natural mind actually goes and says, okay, I've got to keep all the laws of the Bible. No. The word commandments, it means if you keep my directions, which in other words he's saying, if you will do what I'm telling you to do. The, 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 the thing you have to understand is, yeah, everything the Lord says is going to line up with the Torah and the Bible and his laws. But he's going to speak to you, Ed, specifically about what he wants you to do and how he wants you to be. And you too, Bill, you know, every one of us. He wants, those are his commandments. His commandments to Roseanne aren't necessarily going to be the same. It's not going to be the exact same thing he's going to say to me because he knows the language that he can reach me with and same with you and you and you and Rose, all of us. His commandments. It's not about... Well, yeah, I got to go back to Deuteronomy and then, you know, yada, yada, yada. No, it's simpler than that. Your relationship with him, worship, fellowship, revelation. His fellowship with you is your understanding of who he is. When I hear people say things like, well, I really don't believe Jesus is God. 
I think he was just, you know, uh, some other, you know, like a good man or a good teacher. And they'll say, I'm a believer, but I don't believe Jesus is, you know, the Son of God. I don't believe, he, he, yeah, he's the Messiah, but he's not God. That tells me they don't have worship. They certainly don't have fellowship with him. And they're certainly lacking revelation. Because when you fellowship with Yeshua HaMashiach, you realize he's the Lord. He is God. He's the one sent from the Father. He's the Mashiach. That's God. And that's why I fellowship with. So don't come to me with all your Jehovah Witnesses. He's Michael the Archangel. You're not going to get two sets, seconds with me. Or don't, don't come to me as a, as a Mormon saying he's the brother of Lucifer. My God is is not created. Lucifer is a created being. They're not brothers. He's Lord over all. And he will meet with you there. And he is God. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. What do you think, what do you think David was speaking here? Your word guides me all the way through. John, 1 John 1, by the way, many people don't realize this, but the book of Revelation was not written before the three letters of John. These were the last things he wrote. Now that you have that in, in, in place, you can understand some of the things better because he had already had the revelation a few years before. Anyway, 1 John 1, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. How do we have fellowship with one, with one another? We walk in this light. And his blood is continually cleansing us. That means we don't go out of the light. We don't, you know, we don't leave on Tuesday and come back on Shabbat, you know, go in the darkness and come in out of light. No, that, that's crazy talk. But we have our fellowship in his light. Revelation 21, 23. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. So this is going to get more extreme as we go. Amen? Praise God. It's, one, it's wonderful. But understand, this is a whole different dimension. But the dimension of God's light is something he wants us to walk in now. Proverbs 4.18. But the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. So your walk needs to be getting brighter and brighter as you go. You know why? Because as a baby believer, you walk, you're in darkness, and the light is gradually getting better and better. Now as you're growing, it should be bright, brighter, and brightest. And that's what the mercy seat is representing, the light of the Lord. The mercy seat also represents God's throne of grace. His throne of grace is his throne in heaven. The mercy seat is also depicting this. And, of course, there, there's nothing but light, is there? Notice this progression with Moses. This is interesting. This is found in Exodus 33. Then the Lord said to Moses, Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your descendants I will give it. And I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. God's saying he's going to be with them, but he's not going to fellowship with these stiff-necked people. And when the people heard this bad news, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. 
I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Yeah, the, pres the true presence of God and who he actually is and the presence of these people that are stiff-necked, he would consume them. It's by his grace he's even in the tabernacle at all. Now, therefore, take off your ornaments that I may know what to do to you. So the Lord's dealing with them through Moses. Remember, Moses several times had to intercede for these people because the Lord was ready to start over with Moses and his family. He was ready to do it. And Moses interceded for him. But the Lord was going to be with them, but on the Lord's terms. You cannot stand the presence of the Lord on your own, and neither can I. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the Tabernacle of Meeting. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the Tabernacle of Meeting, which was outside the camp. Notice when they first started, he took the tabernacle, he took it away from the people. God actually then had him come back in the middle of the people, but at first he just he knew that God was not going to fellowship with these stiff-necked people. So it was, whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle, that all the people rose, and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass, when Moses entered the tabernacle, that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. So Moses was the one in the tabernacle talking to the Lord. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose and worshipped each man into his tent door. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. So notice that those that cared about it hung out there, Joshua in particular, Moses, speaking with the Lord. But the Lord is too holy. He's too pure to hang out with the stiff-necked people. Then, knowing that, what you know now, you wonder, well, how can God have any fellowship with us in the first place? Well, thank you, Yeshua. This is what it's all about. Because without Jesus in our lives, there is no fellowship. Let's look at the promise of God's presence. Back to Exodus 30, 33. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people. Now, he's talking to God here. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. So notice the boldness that Moses is speaking to the Lord with here. But he's talking to the Lord face to face in the tabernacle. And he said, this is God, and God said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, this is Moses speaking to God, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For then... For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So Moses is having this discussion with God about God's presence with them. And God's presence with us is a very important subject. Because Moses brings up something here that we need to understand. We can go nowhere. We can do nothing without the presence of God with us. People try it. Religious people try it all the time. They just walk by the power of their own natural selves, and they, you know, they head, head out to their job, or they look at their bank account. They don't even think twice about God in their life at all. Yet he's there. There's no fellowship, however. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight. 
and I know you by name. We're saved by grace through faith. Amen? And God knows you by name. And he said, please show me your glory. This is Moses speaking again to God. He's getting pretty, you and I might say, uppity almost, huh? <laughs> then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, this is God speaking to Moses, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And all the, all the Hebrews knew this. And the Lord said, Here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. This is the... the He's put in the cleft of the rock here. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. And this is what God did with Moses. God never made a promise that was too good to be true. D.L. Moody said that. So a lot of this you think, well, that's good for Moses. No, the principle is Yeshua died for our sins so that we might live and have this light we're talking about. This old covenant light was, was God's initiative to bring himself to his people. Now that Yeshua is resurrected from the dead, it's a whole new score. That is why when he was crucified on the cross, the moment he gave up the ghost, the veil in the temple, which was the modern-day tabernacle, was split from top to bottom, signifying we now have access into the place where that light is, where that presence is. This is powerful. These are powerful concepts. Not everyone is afforded the privilege to be allowed into God's presence. Most people, talk to most believers. They don't have any concept of it. That's because... There's not that light there. You see, in our teachings, we're understanding a little bit now. He's given us the light to at least know the way. It's up to you and your faith to walk in the presence of God and have that light in your life. But there is a way, and I want you to know there is a way, and it's up to you to walk in and be in it. God spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Notice that Moses also talked to God what was upon his heart. People get real nervous about this. About, oh, how, how should I pray? You know, should I use King James language? Should I use 16th century language? Be you. He knows you anyway. Speak what's on your heart. He knows what's on your heart anyway. Don't worry about those trifles. To be within the veil means we, like Moses, have found grace in God's sight, and he knows us by name. In the Holy of Holies, we have access to God's glory, which already dwells within our hearts. I've never been put in the, to the cleft of the rock and seen the hinder parts of the Lord. I've never had that happen to me, but Moses did. But I have had some experiences that if I te even tell you right now, you'd go, whoa. But I've had those experiences that I saw with my eyes. And I've had a lot of experiences. For example, I had a, my seventh grandchild last week. I don't know about you, but that's a miracle. Amen? Your children, all that's miraculous. I've had some experiences in, in church services over the years that, that blow me away even today. To think about it. Yeshua the Messiah is our rock. Do you realize what the Bible says about Yeshua the rock? The scripture says that while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, that they were given water from a rock. And this rock, which must have been following them around, this rock was Yeshua. Jesus was that rock. I'm not sure how to put that into words. I'm not sure how I can even imagine how that was. But that's what the scripture says. That's the light that they had. The whole conversation between the Lord and Moses took place in the Holy of Holies. 
at the mercy seat where God said he would talk to his servant Moses. And that mercy seat lies within every believer. He's right there. As a friend talks to a friend. Well, what does God speak to you in your heart? Well, number one, he's going to speak to you as the friend that he is. The Holy Spirit is not a condemning spirit. The Holy Spirit is a nurturing spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us real light and life. Remember, this is your spiritual walk. This is where God wants you to get. He wants you and the Lord to be together. His presence. It says in 1 John 2, Who is a liar but he who denies that Yeshua is the Messiah? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Pretty strong words. The Father and the Son are on the throne right now speaking to our spirit. Scripture tells us that Yeshua is at the right hand of God the Father right now making intercession for us. And the Holy Spirit, who is just as much part of the Godhead as the Father and the Son, lives inside of you. And you have access to the Father and the Son. And it's represented in the mercy seat. Look at what it says in John 14. Yeshua said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? Philip has just asked a question, or he just asked the Lord, he said, Show us the Father, and we'll be satisfied. And this is Yeshua's response to Philip. Yeshua said, I have been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? They're one. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. 